in a galaxy far, far away, no one can hear you scream. No, no, that doesn't work. Welcome to a new audiobook on the Fulcrum Entertainment Channel. You can follow us on Twitter at Fulcrum underscore ENT. My name is Harry, and I will be reading for you Star Wars Death Troopers by Joe Schreiber, a slightly spookier Star Wars story. If you like this episode and you haven't heard our other audiobooks already, please do check in the description below for links to our playlists. And before I start reading, regulars will know I like to shout out to the folks in the comments, so here's a hello to some of the commenters from the end of our Batman audiobook. First off, Ryan Mansfield, thanks so much for commenting again, Ryan, and says, uh, bro, I love the channel, thanks very much, dude, and says, I love what you do, you've inspired me to start my own. Gonna write some Destiny fan stories and make an audio drama with it. Hope to get it started soon. Love your work and I am glad to sub. I am so happy to hear that we could have inspired you, Ryan. And that sounds like a fantastic idea. I am really interested in seeing what happens with it. Hey, perhaps you might need some sort of smooth British-voiced fellow to maybe do something. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. It's a crazy idea. Speaking of crazy ideas, Ryan also suggested that perhaps Halo books would be a good choice to read as well, and I think you might be onto something there, Ryan. I had considered it earlier, partly because I know that our boy Gilbs, uh, the creator of our fantastic audio comics here on the channel and host of the Fulcrum Entertainment podcast, is a big Halo fan, so I think might enjoy some Halo books. I'll continue to shout out people uh, during the video, but I must return to my core programming and begin reading this book. And one fun thing about this book is that our chapters have titles. So chapter one, Purge. The nights were the worst. Even before his father's death, Trig Longo had come to dread the long hours after lockdown. The shadows and sounds and the chronically unstable gulf of silence that drew out in between them. Night after night, he lay still on his bunk and stared up at the dripping durasteel ceiling of the cell in search of sleep or some acceptable substitute. Sometimes he would actually start to drift off, floating away in that comforting sensation of weightlessness, only to be rattled awake, heart pounding, throat tight, stomach muscles sprung and fluttering by some shout or a cry, an inmate having a nightmare. There was no shortage of nightmares aboard the Imperial Prison Barge Purge. Trigg didn't know exactly how many prisoners the Purge was currently carrying. He guessed maybe 500, human and otherwise, scraped from every corner of the galaxy, just as he and his family had been picked up eight standard weeks before. Sometimes the incoming shuttles returned almost empty. On other occasions, they came packed with squabbling alien life forms and alleged rebel sympathizers of every stripe and species. There were assassins for hire and sociopaths, the likes of which Trigg had never seen. Thin lipped things that cackled and sneered in seditious languages that, to Trigg's ears, were little more than clicks and hisses. Every one of them seemed to harbour its own obscure appetites and personal grudges, personal histories blighted with shameful secrets and obscure vendettas. Being cautious became harder. Soon you needed eyes in the back of your head, which some of them actually possessed. Two weeks earlier, in the mess hall, Trigg had noticed a tall, silent inmate sitting with its back to him, but watching him nonetheless, with a single raw red eye in the back of its skull. Every day, the red-eyed thing seemed to be sitting a little nearer. Then, one day, without explanation, it was gone. Except from his dreams. Sighing, Trigg levered himself up on his elbows and looked through the bars onto the corridor. Gen Pop had cycled down to minimum power for the night, edging the long gangway in permanent grey twilight. The Rodians in the cell across from his had gone to sleep or were feigning it. He forced himself to sit there, regulating his breathing, listening to the faint echoes of the convict's uneasy groans and murmurs. Every so often, a mouse droid or low-level maintenance unit, 
one of the hundreds occupying the barge, would scramble by on some pre-programmed errand or another. And, of course, below it all, low and not quite beneath the scope of hearing, was the omnipresent thrum of the barge's turbines gnashing endlessly through space. For as long as they had been aboard, Trigg still hadn't gotten used to that last sound. The way it shook the purge to its framework, rising up through his legs and rattling his bones and nerves. There was no escaping it, the way it undermined every moment of life as familiar as his own pulse. Trigg thought back to sitting in the infirmary just two weeks earlier, watching his father draw one last shaky breath, and the silence afterwards, as the medical droids disconnected the biomonitors from the old man's ruined body and prepared to haul it away. As the last of the monitors fell silent, he'd heard that low, steady thunder of the engines. One more unnecessary reminder of where he was and where he was going. He remembered how that noise had made him feel lost and small and inescapably sad. Some special form of artificial gravity that seemed to work directly against his heart. He had known then, as he knew now, that it really only meant one thing. The ruthlessly grinding effort of the Empire consolidating its power. Forget politics, his father has always said. Just give them something they need, or they'll eat you alive. And now, they'd been eaten alive anyway, despite the fact that they'd never been sympathizers, no more than low-level grifters scooped up on a routine imperial sweep. The engines of tyranny ground on, bearing them forward across the galaxy, towards some remote penal moon. Trigg sensed that noise would continue, would carry on indefinitely, echoing right up until... Trigg! It was Kale's voice behind him, unexpected, and Trigg flinched a little at the sound of it. He looked back and saw his older brother gazing back at him. Kale's handsomely rumpled, sleep slackened face, just a ghostly three quarter profile suspended in the cell's gloom. Kale looked like he was still only partly awake and unsure whether or not he was dreaming any of this. What's wrong? Kale asked. A drowsy murmur that came out was wrong. Trigg cleared his throat. His voice had started changing recently, and he was acutely aware of how it broke high and low when he wasn't paying strict attention. Nothing. You worried about tomorrow? Me? Trigg snorted. Come on. It's okay if you are. Kale seemed to consider this, and then uttered a bemused grunt. You'd be crazy not to be. You're not scared, Trigg said. Dad would never have. I'll go alone. No! The words snapped from his throat with almost painful angularity. We need to stick together. That's what Dad said. You're only 13, Kale said. Maybe you're not, you know, 14 next month. Trigg felt another flare of emotion at the mention of his age. Old enough. You sure? Positive. Well, sleep on it. See if you feel differently in the morning. Kale's enunciation was already beginning to go muddled as he slumped back down on his bunk, leaving Trigg sitting up with his eyes still riveted to the long, dark concourse outside the cell, Genpop, that had become their no longer new home. Sleep on it, he thought. And in that exact moment, Miraculously, as if by the power of suggestion, sleep actually began to seem like a possibility. Trigg lay back and let the heaviness of his own fatigue cover him like a blanket, superseding anxiety and fear. He tried to focus on the sound of Kale's breathing, deep and reassuring, in and out, in and out. Then, somewhere in the depths of the levels, an inhuman voice wailed. Trigg sat up, caught his breath, and felt a chill tighten the skin of his shoulders, arms and back, crawling all over his flesh, millimetre by millimetre, bristling the small hairs on the back of his neck. Over in his bunk, the already sleeping Kale rolled over and grumbled something incoherent. 
There was another scream. Weaker this time. Trigg told himself it was just one of the other convicts. Just another nightmare, rolling off the all-night assembly line of the nightmare factory. But it hadn't sounded like a nightmare. It sounded like a convict. Whatever life form it was, was under attack. Or going crazy. He sat perfectly still, squeezed his eyes tight and waited for the pounding of his own heart to slow down. Just please slow down. But it didn't. He thought of the thing in the cafeteria, the disappeared inmate whose name he'd never known, watching him with its red, staring eye. How many other eyes were on him that he never saw? Sleep on it. But he already knew there would be no more sleeping here tonight. And that's our first chapter done. Ooh, interesting, very evocative, a spooky, creepy atmosphere. And uh, one that you don't often see so much in Star Wars. And I'm most interested about that in this book, to see how it takes a kind of ghostly, horror movie sort of approach to uh, Star Wars. Because Star Wars, to me, is much more light, adventure, fantasy, epicness. Whereas this, ooh, being creepy, now that's a whole different ballgame. We have the mystery so far of whatever it is that Kale and his brother Trigg are going to do. Something that Trigg might not be old enough for and could split them up. I wonder perhaps is it some sort of prison escape they're going to try? Or is this some sort of thing that the Imperials are going to make them do? Something that they're coming to separate them or to send them to some sort of penal colony? Hmm. What do you guys think? Uh, if you've got any theories, or perhaps, I suppose, if you know, but maybe give us clues rather than full-on spoilers, let us know in the comments. Speaking of comments, let's give a shout-out to Samuel Cuthbert, who commented on the final video of the Batman audiobook. Uh, a couple of things. One saying, wow, almost there, 1,000 subscribers. Hope you get there. Yes, yeah, we're so close to the 1,000 subscribers, and Gilbert wants us to do a uh, special long live stream to celebrate it, so do keep an eye out on the podcast. I'm sure we will have some live uh, story readings. So yeah, make sure that you are subscribed and that you have that bell icon clicked so you find out what we're up to and you don't miss it. Samuels also said, uh, sorry I didn't comment on the last video, been very busy, but it's still been following along. Keep up the good work. Uh, Samuel, absolutely. I, it, I love to have comments so that I get the chance to talk to you, but if you're too busy, man, there's no need to apologise. I am so happy that you're still reading and that you're still able to enjoy the audiobooks while you're being busy. Um, I hope that they can help out with it. But, yep, absolutely, there is no obligation to comment. I just i am so grateful for your support. Thanks very much, man. Now let's begin reading Chapter 2, which has the ominous title of Meat Nest. In Trigg's old life, Back on Kimarosa, breakfast had been the best meal of the day. Besides being an expert trafficker in contraband, a veteran fringe dweller who had cut countless deals with thieves, spies, and counterfeits, Von Longo had also been one of the galaxy's greatest unrecognized breakfast chefs. Eat a good meal early, Longo always told his boys. You never know if it's going to be your last. Here on The Purge, however, Breakfast was rarely edible, and sometimes actually seemed to shiver in the steady vibrations as though still alive on the plate. This morning, Trigg found himself gazing down at a pasty mass of colourless goo spooned into shaved gristle, the whole thing plastered together in sticky wads like some kind of meat nest assembled by carnivorous flying insects. He was still nudging the stuff listlessly around his tray when Kale finally raised his eyebrows and peered at him. Did you sleep at all last night? Kale asked. A little. You're not eating. What? You mean this? Trigg poked at the contents of the tray again and shuddered. I'm not hungry, he said, and watched Kale shovel the last bite of his own breakfast into his mouth with disturbing gusto. You think the food will be any better when we get to the detention moon? Little brother, I think we'll be lucky if we don't end up on the menu. Trigg gave him a bleak look. Don't give him any ideas. Hey, lighten up. Kale wiped his mouth on his sleeve and grinned. A little guy like you, they'll probably just use you for an appetizer. Trigg put his fork down again with a snort to show that he got the joke. 
although he couldn't have articulated it, his big brother's easy-going bravado, so obviously inherited from their old man, made him downright envious. Kale wasn't wired for fear. It just didn't stick to him somehow. The only thing that ever really seemed to trouble him was the prospect of not getting another helping of whatever the COO 2180s behind the lunch counter had been slopping onto the inmates' trays. Out of nowhere, from the ridiculous to the sublime, Trigg found himself thinking about his father again. Their final conversation hung in his memory with stinging vividness. Just before he'd passed away in the infirmary, the old man had reached up, clutched Trigg's hand in both of his, and whispered, Watch over your brother. Caught off guard, Trigg had just nodded and stammered out that he would, of course he would. But soon afterward, he realised that his dad, in his final moments, must have been confused about which son he was talking to. There was no reason he'd ask Trigg to look after Kale. It would be like assigning the safekeeping of a Wampa to a Kuwaitian monkey lizard. What's wrong with you anyway? Kale asked from across the table. I'm fine. Come on, fess up. Trigg pushed the tray aside. I don't see how they can serve us this stuff day after day, that's all. Hey, uh, that reminds me. As if on cue, Kale flicked his eyes over at Trigg's tray. You gonna eat that? When the alarm shrilled out at the end of the meal, he and Kale stood up and slipped through the mess hall along with the sea of other inmates. From overhead observation decks, a retinue of uniformed Imperial Corrections officers and armed stormtroopers stood watch, observing their passage into the common area with soulless black eyes. Down below, the prisoners sauntered in packs, muttering and laughing among themselves, deliberately dragging out the process as much as possible to exploit whatever small amount of leniency the guards granted them. There was a sticky, smelly closeness to their unwashed bodies, and Trigg thought of the phrase meat nest again, and felt a little nauseated. This whole place was a meat nest. Little by little, with studied casualness, he and Kale slowed down, falling farther back from the crowd. Although he didn't say a word, a subtle change had already worked its way through Kale's posture, straightening his spine and shoulders a serene vigilance moving over his face, supplanting the old, insouciant gleam. His eyes darted right and left now, never stopping anywhere for longer than a moment or two. You ready for this? he asked, barely moving his lips. Sure, Trigg said, nodding. You? Full on. Nothing about Kale's face seemed to indicate that he was speaking at all. Remember, when we get down there, it's going to be close quarters. Whatever you do, always maintain eye contact. Don't look away for a second. Got it. And if anything starts to feel wrong about it, and I mean anything whatsoever, we just walk away. Now Kale did a glance at his brother's face, perhaps catching a whiff of his apprehension. I don't think Sixtus would try anything, but I can't vouch for Miss. Dad never trusted him. Maybe, Trigg started, and stopped himself. He realised that he was about to suggest calling off the whole deal. Not because he was nervous, although he certainly was, but because Kale seemed to be having second thoughts too. We can do this, Kale went on. Dad taught us everything we need to know. The whole thing should take no more than a minute or two, and we'll be back out of there and back in full view. Any longer than that and it gets dangerous. He jerked his head around and looked hard at Trigg. And I go first. Clear? Trigg nodded and felt a hand drop on his shoulder, stopping him in his tracks. Ooh, okay. So we have some shorter chapters in this book. So, that's chapter two. Okay, so this seems to be some sort of scheme. Perhaps some kind of heist? Are they going to rob a fellow inmate? Hmm, what's happening here? Or is this some sort of business deal that they're going to try and do? with a fellow inmate. The term meat nest was uh, mentioned there a couple of times. Do you think it'll uh, come back up later on in the story? A meat nest makes me think of a dead space and the necromorphs and the strange masses of flesh that you encounter in that game. Although the other description of meat nest in uh, this chapter where it was just 
the B.O. of hundreds of aliens crammed together perhaps might be even more disgusting than what's in Dead Space. And before we move on, just one last shout out to a comment from our previous video, the end of the Batman Arkham Knight Riddler's Gambit audiobook. Sweet Mango Limited says, Listened and enjoyed this book, bud. I like the Riddler in this. Cunning and smart. Yes, the Riddler really was on his A-game, as another of our regulars said, Mac Curtis, uh, in that book. Really fantastic book. Uh, please, if you are listening to this and you haven't checked it out, maybe go and listen to it after this video. But now, we're moving on to chapter 3, titled, Where the Bad Air Goes. Trigg turned and looked up at the figure standing in front of him. You! It was a piggy-eyed guard whose name he didn't remember, peering back at him through a pair of tinted, decidedly non-regulation optic shields. What are you doing all the way back here? Trigg tried to answer, but found his reply lodged somewhere just beneath his gullet. Kale stepped in, offering up an easy, disarming smile. Just walking, sir. Was I talking to you, convict? the guard said, and without waiting for an answer, pivoted his attention back to Trigg. Well? He's right, sir, Trigg said. We were just walking. What? You're too good to move along with the rest of the scum? We're trying to avoid scum wherever possible, Trigg said, and then added, Sir? The guard's eyes slitted behind the lenses. You yanking me, convict? No, sir. Because the last maggot that yanked me is doing a month in the hole. Understood, sir. The guard glowered at him, twitching his head slightly to one side, as if searching out some angle at which Twitch's unblemished teenage face might somehow become threatening, or even make sense amid this larger mass of incarcerated criminals. Watching his expression, Trigg punished himself by imagining a glimmer of recognition in those squinty eyes, and for an instant he thought how bizarre it might be if the guard had said, you're Von Longo's boys, aren't you? I heard what happened to your father. He was a good man. But of course, no guard on this barge thought Longo had been a good man, or even bothered to learn his name. And now he was dead, and already so completely forgotten that he might as well have never ever lived. And the guard just shook his head. Move away, the guard muttered, and walked away. The moment they were out of earshot, Kale elbowed Trigg in the shoulder. We try to avoid scum wherever possible? A tiny grin dimpled the corners of Kale's mouth. What, did you just make that up on the spot? Trigg was unable to restrain a smile of his own. It felt liberating, probably because he couldn't remember the last time he'd allowed himself anything less than a troubled grimace. You think he bought it? I think you almost bought it. Kale reached up without looking over and tuzzled his fingers through Trigg's hair. Keep smarting off like that, convict, and you'll be down in solitary with real dangerous types. I hear there's a couple of hard guys down there now locked up tight, Trigg said. Could be our future customers. Kale favored him with a glance of approval. He got a lot more of dad in you than I thought, he said. And with one last look at the prisoners in front of them, nodded ever so slightly to the left. Come on, follow me, and don't get crazy, okay? Sure. Trigg sensed Kale slowing his pace, dropping back several strides, scarcely enough to be noticed, and adjusted his step to match his brother's. Up ahead, the main concourse broke off into three prongs, branching off into a series of lesser thoroughways that crisscrossed the detention levels at every imaginable vector and angle. During his time aboard, Trigg had made it his business to learn as much about the Purge's layout as possible. Eavesdropping on conversations between guards and maintenance droids, he learned early that there were six main detention levels, each one housing about 20 to 30 individual holding cells. Above that was the mess hall, followed by the admin offices, prison staff quarters and the infirmary. Nobody talked much about solitary, down at the bottom of the barge, 
nor was there much speculation about the literally hundreds of metres of narrow access routes, sublevels, and dimly lit concourses that honeycombed every level. Falling into single file, Kale and Trigg slipped through an open gateway, striding along the damp prefab walls, down a flight of steps, deeper into the jaundiced, subcutaneous bowels of Genpop. The air down here immediately became thicker, darker, and dramatically less breathable, on its way to an array of refurbished air scrubbers before circulating back through the barge. Well, well, a voice said. The Longo Brothers ride again. Trigg caught a quick breath, hoping it didn't sound like a gasp. In front of him, Kale froze, instinctively extending a hand behind him, and both of them peered into the open space that made up their immediate future. It took no extra time for Trigg's vision to adjust. He could already make out the forms of several inmates, all members of the Delphanian Face Gang and in front of them, our miss. Whether Miss's nearly vertical sneer was a genetic accident or the result of one of his legendary knife fights was a matter of perpetual speculation among the other inmates. Below the flattened suede accordion of his nose, a row of mismatched tribal piercings dangled from the drooping lower lip collected like trophies from all the other crew leaders while Miss and his boss, Sixtus Cleft, had slowly consolidated the face gang's position as the Purge's preeminent prison crew. You're right on time, Miss said, piercings jingling as he spoke. Kale nodded. We're always prompt. An admirable trait for a prison rat. That's why you choose to do business with us. One of the many reasons, Miss said. I'm sure. Kale smiled. Did you bring the payment? Oh, yes. Miss produced a sibilant gurgle that might have been laughter and extended one spade claw hand, pointing down at the empty floor in front of him. It's right there in front of you. Don't you see it? Trigg sensed, or perhaps only imagined, his older brother stiffening, preparing for trouble, and willed Kale to stay calm. It appeared to work. For the time being, at least, Kale kept his posture erect and didn't look away, careful to keep his own voice steady and calm. Is this some kind of joke? Perhaps. Miss looked at the Delphanian foot soldiers standing on either side of him, grinning and sniggering. Maybe you just don't share our sense of humor. Our deal with Sixtus. Sixtus is dead. Kale stared at him. What? A terrible tragedy. <laughs> Miss was almost whispering, and the mushy sibilance in between words Trigg realised, was definitely laughter this time, accompanied by the faint metallic jingle of his piercings. I see O Wembley found him in his cell this morning with his throat slashed. <laughs> I'm the new skipper now. He stopped, and then his voice abruptly frosted over. And alas, the terms of our deal have changed. You can't do that, Trigg cut in, unable to hold back any longer. Sixtus and our dad... No, it's all right, Kale said, still not taking his eyes off Miss. And when he spoke again, he sounded absolutely calm. I'm just sorry things worked out this way. Miss appeared genuinely curious. Oh? None of this is necessary. Kale's voice was so casual... It almost like listening to their father talk. That same mellifluous, we can work this out inflection that had gotten them out of so many dicey exchanges in the past. We've built a mutually beneficial relationship here, and it's crazy to jeopardize it with rash decisions. Rash decisions? Kale waved a hand in the air. 
Of course, we'll be happy to tell you where the blasters and the power packs are hidden, free of charge. Take them with my compliments. Consider it my gift to you as the new leader of the Face Gang. And everyone walks out of here to do business another day. A generous proposal, Miss seemed to consider the idea for a long moment. There's only one problem. What's that? Miss glanced at the Delphanian inmates slathering next to him on either side. I had already promised my men that they could kill you. I see. Kale hove up a dramatic sigh. Ah, <sighs> in that case, I, I guess we don't have a deal, huh? No. Well, I suppose there's only one thing left to do. Our miss tilted his chin upward slightly. And that would be... At first, none of them moved, and Trigg had no idea what was going to happen. Then, before he realized it, Kale's hand blurred forward, moving faster than Trigg could even see, his fingers hooking down to rip the piercings out of Miss's face. The Delphanian shrieked in surprise and pain, and one of his hands flew up to cover his wounded, spurting lips and nose. Simultaneously, the two inmates who had been flanking him burst forward in a rush, and Kale grabbed his brother's shoulder, spun him hard around, and thrust him back in the direction they'd come. Run! Kale shouted, and they did. Trigg first, Kale behind him, both of them flying back up the corridor they'd just come down. Behind, the Delphanian's boots clanged off the metal floor, and Trigg could hear them shouting, coming closer. There was no way he and his brother could possibly outrun them, and even if by some quirk of fate they did escape, our miss would be waiting for them tomorrow, and the next day, and... Rounding the bend, Trigg almost collided with the guard standing directly in front of him. The ICO put up both hands in a reflective, warding-off gesture, and the sudden stop that kept Trigg from slamming into him was followed an instant later by Kale hitting him from behind. What's going on here? the guard asked. Nothing, sir. We just... Trigg started. And it occurred to him that there was no reasons why the guards should be this far down the walkways to begin with. And then, between the pounding rhythm of his own heart, he realized something else. The purge had fallen absolutely silent. The vibrations that had unsettled him, broadcasting their emanations up through the bones of his feet, ankles and knees, had gone completely still. For the first time since he'd come aboard, the engines had stopped. There's where chapter 3 ends. Quite an exciting chapter. That was kind of cool. That gang is interesting. Uh, the the Delphanians, now those... Um, also, if I'm pronouncing that wrong and someone knows, please let me know. Um, I tried to look up uh, the species to see if I could find more about them, but I think they might be made up for this book. A little, maybe, I'm not sure. I couldn't see any pictures. I know that the Fulcrum Entertainment audience is full of absolutely wonderful Star Wars experts out there. So if anyone's listening and knows more about Delphanians that they want to tell me to educate me, I would really appreciate it. Thank you very much. But meanwhile, we'll keep reading. These are short chapters, so we're just going to zoom through them. Chapter 4, Medbay Hey, Waste, Zahara Cody said. Are we there yet? The 2-1-B surgical droid looked up at her with a blank stare. It had been in the process of injecting a syringe of Colto into the left arm of the Doug inmate lying in the oversized med center bunk between them. Within seconds of receiving the injection, the dug writhed and rolled up onto its back, twitching its lower legs beneath the sheet, then stiffened and lapsed into a very convincing state of rigor mortis. Congratulations, Zahara said. You killed him. Looks like you've saved the Empire another 400 credits. Reaching over, she tapped the surgical droid on the shoulder. Job well done. Way to be a team player. The 2-1-B looked at her in something like alarm. But I didn't. Let me do a quick test just to confirm time of death. Zahara reached down and rolled the dug sideways, pushing it over until it fell out of bed with a thud. 
Seconds later, the inmate sat up with a squeal of displeasure, scuttling back up to its bunk where it glared at her balefully and muttered some black, condemnatory oath under its breath. Looks like another miracle recovery, Zahara said and smiled. Another one of your many skills, apparently. A most irregular approach, Waste intoned, and something deep inside its torso, cowling, clicked and whirred. Don't you think that given the patient's ongoing complaints, we should run some additional tests? Unless I'm mistaken, this particular patient's main complaint is with the food. Zahara glanced at the dug and maybe one of the several different prison gangs that want his scalp for overdue loan payments. That's about right, isn't it, Tugnut? The dog snarled and jerked one hand up in a gesture that transcended language barriers, then went back to faking its own death. Scramble up an orderly droid, Zahara said. Have him taken back to his cell. She looked back at the 2-1-B. You're aware, Waste, that you still haven't answered my initial question? Excuse me? Are we there yet? Uh, Dr. Cody, if you're referring to our ETA at Detention Moon Gradient 7, the Purge is a prison barge, Waste. Where else would we be headed? Wild space? She waited patiently to see if the 2-1-B was going to favour her with another of its flat, implacable glances. Throughout the last three months of working alongside the droid, Zahara Cody had come to think of herself as a connoisseur of such reactions, the way that some people collected rare pseudogenic polymorph species or trinkets from older pre-imperial cultures. We've already dropped out of hyperspace. Our engines have been stopped for almost an hour and we're just sitting here stock still, so that can only mean one thing, right? We must be there. Actually, uh, Doctor, my uplink to the Never computer indicates that... Hey, Doc! A blunt finger reached out from behind Zahara and prodded her somewhere in the vicinity of her lower spine. We there yet? Zahara looked over at the Deveronian inmate sprawled languorously on his side on the bed behind her, then turned back at her surgical droid. See, Waste, it's the question on everyone's lips. No, I'm serious, Doc. The Deveronian groaned, peering up at her from the depths of melancholy. His right horn had been snapped off mid-trunk, giving his face a peculiar lopsided look, and he poked himself in the abdomen and groaned. One of my livers is going bad, I can feel it. Thinking maybe I caught something in the shower. May I offer a more likely diagnosis? The 2-1-B scurried eagerly around Zahara, already exchanging tools in its servo grips as the internal components of its diagnostic computer flickered beneath its torso sheath. Liver damage in your species is not uncommon. In many cases, your silver-based blood results in depleted oxygen due to the low-level addiction to the recreational use of... Hey, interface! The Deveronian sat up, suddenly the robust picture of perfect health, and grabbed the 2-1-B's pincer. What are you saying about my species? Easy, Gat, he doesn't mean anything by it. Zahara placed a hand on the inmate's wrist until he released the droid. Then, turning to the 2-1-B, Waste, why don't you go check out what's happening with the Trandoshan in B-17, huh? His temp's up again and I don't like the last white counts I saw this morning. I doubt he'll make it through the day. Oh, I concur. The droid brightened. According to my programming at Rinnell State Medical Academy. Right, so I'll meet you later for afternoon rounds, all right? The 2-1-B hesitated, seeming briefly to entertain the idea of objecting, then walked away, clucking softly to itself in dismay. Zahara watched it go, its gangling legs and oversized feet passing between the rows of bunks that lined the infirmary on either side. Only half of those beds were full, but that was still more than she would have preferred. As chief medical officer on the purge, she knew that at any given time, a large percentage of her patients were dogging it, either prolonging their stay in medbay or faking it entirely to stay out of genpop. But it had been a long trip and supplies were low. Even with the 2-1-B, the prospect of a legitimate medical emergency. You okay, Doc? 
Looking down, she realised that the Deveronian was watching her from his bed, fidgeting nonchalantly with his broken horn. Sorry? I said you were right. You look a little, uh, I don't know. I'm fine, Gat, thanks. Hey. The inmate glanced off in the direction that the surgical droid had gone. That uh, bucket of bolts won't hold it against me, you think? Who? Waste? She smiled. Believe me, he's a paragon of scientific objectivity. Just throw some obscure symptoms at him and he'll be your best friend. You really think we're almost there? She shrugged. I don't know. You know how it is. Nobody tells me anything. Right, the devish said and shook his head with a chuckle. Aboard the barge, there were a few phrases that circulated among the gen pop endlessly. Are we there yet? And they expect us to eat this stuff? Were chief among them. But nobody tells me anything was also a big favourite. Over months of service, Zahara had adopted these phrases as well, much to the chagrin of the warden and many of the ICOs, most of whom held themselves up as an example of superior species. Zahara knew what they said about her. Among the guards, no real effort was made to keep it subtle. Too much time spent down in the med bay with the scum and droids, and the little rich girl had started to go native, preferring the company of inmates and synthetics to her own kind corrections officers and stormtroopers. Most of the guards had stopped talking to her completely after the situation two weeks ago. She didn't suppose she blamed them. They were a notoriously tight-knit group and seemed to function with a group think that she found downright nauseating. Even the inmates, her regulars, the ones she saw on a daily basis, had noticed a change in the way she'd started spending extra time training waste preparing the 2-1-B not as her assistant anymore, but as her replacement. And although there hadn't been any official response from the warden, she could only assume that he'd received her resignation. After all, she'd walked into his office and slammed it down on his desk. There was no way she could keep working here. Not after what had happened with Von Longo. Take a girl from a wealthy family of Corellian financiers and tell her she'll never have a care in the world. Ship her off to the best schools, tell her there's a spot waiting for her in the intergalactic banking clan. All she has to do is not mess up. Keep her nose clean, uphold the highest standards of politics, culture and good manners, and ignore the fact that compared with what she's used to, 99% of the galaxy is hungry, sick and uneducated. Embrace the Empire with its quaint lack of diplomatic subtlety and strive to overlook the increasingly uncomfortable squeeze of Lord Vader's ever-tightening fist. Flash to fifteen years later. The girl, now a woman, decides to go to Rinal to study, of all things, medicine. That dirtiest of sciences. Better left to droids. Full of blood and pus and contagion, hardly what her parents had hoped for. But the decision is made to indulge her, based on the hope that it is just an idealistic whim and soon enough little Zahara will be back to take her rightful position at the family table. After all, she's young, she has plenty of time. Except it doesn't play out that way. Two years into Renal, Zahara meets a surgeon twice her age, a craggy veteran of hundreds of humanitarian missions beyond the core worlds, who opens her eyes to the true need of the galaxy around her. The mismatched love affair runs its course predictably enough, but even after that part of it winds down, Zahara can't forget the picture he's painted for her, a mural of staggering need. Beings whose desperation is utterly beyond her ken. He reminds her that the poor are out there in their countless millions, humans and non-human alike, young ones dying of malnutrition and sickness, while the galaxy's upper echelons bask in self-induced oblivion. You can either live with something like that, the surgeon tells her, on what turns out to be one of their last nights together, or you can't. And it turns out, she can't. After being universally rejected by various aid groups because of her lack of experience, Zahara makes the decision to go work for the Empire, which her family reluctantly accepts. At least, it's a known entity. 
but in a capacity that leaves her parents speechless, stupefied and outraged. No daughter of theirs is going to work on an imperial prison barge. The indignity of it is just beyond all scale. Yet here I am, Zahara thought now, queen of her own miniature kingdom after all, duchess of the empty bunks and our lady of the perpetual stomachache involuntary lust object of a hundred emotionally frustrated prison guards and deprived stormtroopers, dispenser of medicine, charged with keeping the inmates of the Imperial Prison Barge Purge alive long enough to be permanently detained on some remote prison moon. The irony, of course, was that in a standard week's time, or whenever they finally arrived at their destination, she would be going back to her father and mother, if not exactly hat in hand, then close enough. Her mother would sniff and scowl, her brother would jeer, but her father would throw his arms around his little girl and after the acceptable amount of time had passed, her penance would be complete and she would be welcomed back into the fold. And her time aboard the barge would become what they'd thought it would be all along, an adventure in her youth, a charming dinner anecdote for diplomats. (laughs) <laughs> You'll never believe how our little girl decided to spend her youth. Looking through the med bay again, Zahara felt a thin tremor of uncertainty steal over her and willed it away. But, like most aspects of her personality, it didn't go without a fight. Instead, unbidden, the image of Von Longo floated back into her memory the man's bloody face trying to talk to her through the ventilator, clutching her hand in both of his, asking to see his boys one last time, begging her to bring them to him so that he could speak to them in private. Moments later, the cloud of heavy menace emerged behind her back, and she turned to see Jareth Sartoris, close enough that she could actually smell his skin, speaking through thin lips that hardly seemed to move. Paying your respects, Doctor. Longo had died later that day, and Zahara Cody decided that she had flown her last voyage with the Purge and the Empire. The next step would be contacting her parents and letting them know she was coming home. Luxurious clothing and fine crystal had never been her first choice, but at least she'd be able to sleep at night. And in the evenings, she would sit down to dinner with the wealthy and proud and forget about what had happened with Von Longo and Jareth Sartoris. Is this really what you want? Zahara shook it off. In any case, she'd always assumed that she'd have lots of time to think about it before the barge got to where it's going. Plenty of time to make up her mind. Except now the engines had stopped. Had been stopped for over an hour. From across the infirmary, Another voice, one of the other inmates, cried out, Hey, Doc, are we there yet? This time, Zahara didn't answer. Well, at the end of chapter four, I think I can say I do understand Zahara's position. How difficult that must be. Personally, I find that it can take a huge amount of strength and uh, it can be so difficult to keep working in any form of healthcare work. Uh, It's something that I haven't experienced and because frankly I I don't think I have what it takes. But to do that aboard an Imperial prison barge and then when we get the other mystery of what has happened to Von Longo, what is it that's left Kale and Trig orphans because it seems like there was some foul play going on there, particularly with Jareth, the uh, commanding officer aboard this barge. Now, I believe we're going to meet Jareth in our next chapter so let's jump on into that to find out more information about him. Chapter 5. Word Jareth Sartoris made his way down the narrow gangway outside the guard's quarters, massaging his temples as he walked. He had a headache. Nothing new there, but this one was something special. A vice grip across his temporal lobes that made him feel like he'd been gassed with some kind of low-grade neurotoxin in his sleep. The greasy smear of breakfast down the back of his throat hadn't helped. He'd been awake even before the warden's summons came through. After working third shift last night, he toppled into his bunk early this morning and lapsed into restless unconsciousness. 
but two hours later, the abrupt silence had wakened him, the feeling of his tightly coiled world spinning off its axis. They were seven standard days out, so why had the engines fallen silent? Sartorius had gotten dressed, grabbed some lukewarm calf and a reheated bantha patty from the mess, and headed down the hall toward the warden's office, hoping to build up enough mindless momentum to keep him going as far as he needed. To his right, the turbo lift doors opened. Three other guards, Vesic, Austin, and some pompadour newbie came out, falling in step behind him. They had to walk single file to fit comfortably down the hall. Satoris didn't break stride or even glance back at them. Me and the guys, Cap, Austin's voice piped up after a respectful pause. We were wondering if, uh, you know, you could shed a little light on what's going on. Sartorius shook his head, still not looking back. What's that? I heard we blew out both thrusters completely, Vesic put in. Word is we're just sitting here somewhere outside the unknown regions waiting for a tow. Austin sniggered. Barge full of stranded convicts. I'm sure we're top priority for the Empire. Stang, Vesic said. Maybe they'll just decide to leave us drifting out here, right? Ask the Rook. Austin poked the pompadour guard walking in front of him. Hey, Armitage, you think they'll rescue us? He sniggered, not waiting for the kid to respond. He'll probably like you. Suits his artistic temperament. Right, Armitage? The newbie just ignored him and kept walking. How long you spend on your hair this morning, Rook? You open Dr. Cody's taking an interest. All right, Satoris snapped a glance up at them. Belay that noise, understand? Nobody spoke the rest of the way to the warden's office. Cloth's office had been tricked out to look larger than it actually was. Light colours, hollow murals, and a colossal rectilinear view screen facing out of the star-strewn expanse. But Sartorius had always found the effect paradoxically oppressive. Some time ago, he'd noticed a blown voxel in the corner of the desert landscape above Cloth's desk, a missed stitch in the digital fabric. Ever since then, something about the second-hand technology seemed to be pushing in on him, and now his eyes always felt as if they were being tricked, lulled into a false sense of openness. First, the bad news, Cloth said. He was standing in his usual position, hands clasped behind his back, looking at the view screen. Our thrusters are seriously damaged, probably beyond repair. And as I'm sure you'll know, we're still seven sanded days out from our destination. One of the other guards, the rookie probably, let out a nearly inaudible groan. Sartorius only heard it because he was standing next to him. However, the warden continued, there is a positive side. Cloth turned slowly to face them. Upon first glance, his face was the usual blunt, bureaucratic hatchet. Slightly curved and angular upper lip, grey-rimmed eyes, and bluish silver bags of freshly shaven cheeks. Only after spending a certain amount of time with the man did you come to know that the soft thing residing in that calculated outer shell, a spineless, gelatinous creature that exuded nothing so much as the tremulous anxiety of being drawn out and exposed. It seems the navicomputer has identified an imperial vessel, Cloth said. A star destroyer, actually, within this same system. While our attempts to make contact have met with no reply, we do have enough power to make our approach. He paused here, apparently in anticipation of applause, or at least a round of relieved sighs. But Sartorius and the others just looked at him. A destroyer, Austin asked. And they're not responding to our call? Cloth didn't answer for a moment. He touched his chin, fingering it thoughtfully. A pompous and disaffected gesture Sartorius had seen a thousand times and had come to loathe in his own special way. There's more to it than that, he said. According to our bio scans, there's only a handful of life forms on board. How many's a handful? Vesic wanted to know. Ten, perhaps twelve. Ten or twelve? Vesic shook his head. 
Sounds like a scanner issue. Destroyers can carry a few of 10,000 or more. Thank you, Cloth said dryly. I'm well aware of the standard Imperial specs. Sorry, sir, it's just either our equipment is undergoing some serious malfunction or... Or there's something else going on up there. It was the first time Sartorius had spoken in the office, and he was surprised at the hoarseness in his voice. Something that we don't want any part of. The others all turned to look at him. For what felt like a long time after that, no one spoke. Then the warden cleared his throat. What are you saying, Captain? There's no reason the Empire would just abandon an entire Star Destroyer out here in the middle of nowhere without good reason. He's right, Austin said. Maybe. Internal atmosphere diagnostics show no sign of any known toxin or contamination, Cloth said. Of course, it's always possible that our instruments are misreading how many life forms are on board. We screen for numerous variables, electrical brain activity, pulse, motion. Any number of those things could skew the reading. In any case, he smiled, a wholly unconvincing dramatization that ought to have involved invisible wires and hooks on either side of his mouth. The most critical factor is that we may be able to salvage equipment for our thrusters and get back on course before we're completely behind schedule. To that end, I'll be sending a scouting party up. Uh, Captain Sartorius, along with ICOs Austin, Vesic and Armitage, and the mechanical engineers to see what they can salvage. We anticipate docking within an hour. Questions? There were none, and Cloth dismissed them in the usual fashion, by turning his back and letting them find their own way out. Sartorius was about to follow them when the warden's voice stopped him. Captain! Stopping in the doorway, Sartorius drew a breath and felt the ache in his head become deeper, a more impacted pounding, like a gargantuan infected tooth somewhere in his frontal sinus. The door closed behind him, and it was just the two of them in what felt like an increasingly shrunken space. Am I making a mistake, sending you up with these men? Excuse me, sir? Sir! Cloth's smile rematerialized, a wisp of its former self. Now that's a word I haven't heard from you in a long time, Captain. We haven't seen each other much lately. I'm aware that this voyage has been particularly challenging for you personally, Cloth said, and Sartorius found himself hoping fervently that the warden wouldn't start stroking his chin again. If he did... Sartorius wasn't sure he could rein in the urge to punch him straight in his pompous and disaffected face. After what happened two weeks ago, in many ways I expected your resignation right alongside Dr. Cody's. Why? She saw you kill an inmate in cold blood. It was her word against mine. Your antiquated interrogation techniques aren't appropriate anymore, Captain. You're costing the Empire more information than you're retrieving. All due respect, sir, Longo was nobody. A grifter. We'll never know now, will we? Sartorius felt his fists clenching at his sides until his nails burrowed into his palms, delivering stinging pain deep into the skin. You want me off your boat, warden, you just say the word. On the contrary, you may consider this mission an opportunity to redeem yourself. If not in my eyes, then certainly in the eyes of the Empire, to which we both owe so very much. Is that understood? Yes, sir. Cloth turned and scrutinized him as if for any sign of sarcasm or mockery. In his decades of service, Jareth Sartorius had been to the very edges of the galaxy, living under conditions he wouldn't wish on his worst enemy. He'd had to sleep in places and commit unspeakable deeds that he would have given entire body organs to forget. That simple yes, sir, didn't taste any worse than the rest of it. So we're clear then, Cloth said. Crystal, Sartorius replied. And when Cloth turned to show him his back, 
It wasn't a moment too soon. The warden's office was bigger than any other on the barge, but it was still too small for Sartoris. And as the cooler air of the outer corridor hit him, he realized he'd sweated through the armpits of his uniform completely. Well, that's an interesting image to end our first part of this audiobook on, but we have come to the close of the video. So, this is exciting and we're seeing it develop. Um, I do particularly like the uh, the foreshadowing of, oh, our instruments show that there's nothing toxic or certainly no strange diseases or viruses, certainly nothing that could turn you into a zombie, I'm sure. That would never be on the abandoned Star Destroyer drifting in space. No, it'll be just fine, believe me. Um, that's quite fun. I, I am excited to see them getting onto that ship. I love stuff like this. I'm a big fan of this kind of sci-fi, um, horror story thing, you know. I love a bit of Alien. I love me, uh, some, like, Dead Space I mentioned before. Event Horizon. Event Horizon is one of my favourite examples of the guys go onto an abandoned ship. Uh, the 1990s Lost in Space movie. Uh, another example, but, eh, not as good. Matt LeBlanc hanging out with a CGI monkey? Meh, nah. nah. And the mystery of Von Longo's death gets deeper. So, it is at Sartorius's hand during some form of torture, or interrogation as they said. And Zahara's involved, but what could it have been? I think there's more to this that we don't know yet, and I'm waiting for it all to be resolved. I have a sneaking suspicion, and perhaps you do as well, that Von Longo knew something, perhaps something that could be very important, to the events that are about to occur in this book. But if you'd like to find out what those events are, you will have to come back next week when the next part of our audiobook comes out. And hopefully we've got some comments there, so I will be chatting away with you to make sure that you come and see us next week, please. The best thing to do is to subscribe to us and hit that bell icon so YouTube will let you know when our new videos come up and it'll let you know when we're live. So you can be like, hey, let's go talk to the boys about Moon Knight and hang out. If you've enjoyed this video, please do give it a like. But the biggest thing that I always ask for, and I think it's a fantastic thing if you can do for us, if you know someone else who loves audiobooks, who loves Star Wars stories, who loves Batman stories, anything, just let them know about our channel. Let them know about one of the videos, send it in a WhatsApp message, drop it on Facebook, whatever. I don't mind, but just let someone else know. That means so much to us and it really helps us build the channel and get more going on here. I'll even give you a recommendation right now. If you are enjoying Moon Knight on Disney+, Plus, then go over to the Russian Comic Book Geek here on YouTube. It's a wonderful uh, channel that makes audio comics and has plenty of Moon Knight comics coming out in the moment. Also, there's a bunch of other comics that feature me. For example, go and check out the Books of Doom audio comic that he made. I play pretty much everyone that is a man and isn't Doctor Doom. It's loads of fun. But you can't forget about us here at Fulcrum Entertainment, because, my friends, you must remember, we are all Fulcrum. <laughs>